but it says we'll be reading from the NIV, but we're not. We're reading from the NLT because that's what my Bible is. So, follow along. <laughs> you do what I say. <laughs> Jesus, the true vine. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. This is the word of the Lord, or this is the word of God for the people of God. I know, I need to say thanks be to God. Right? <laughs> this is the word of the Lord, and then you guys say thanks be to God. It's like a Catholic. You guys want to, you guys want to practice? Yeah, I say this. Is are, you, are you ready? So, it will go like this. I'm going to say the word of God for the people of God, and you all will say thanks, thanks be to God. God. All right? So, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Man, you guys are killer. Good job. <laughs> There, there is something about, I didn't even grow up in a, I did not grow up in a call and response uh, church. I, how many people did? Brandon? No? Anybody else? Maddie? So call and response is a little more of a high liturgical thing that's pretty fun. Uh, and it's something that, I don't know, there's something about being in a group that's just awesome. And when you call and respond and you talk to each other, it's just meaningful. Right, Stephen? Stephen, did your church do call and response growing up? Dude, <laughs> man, he's feeling it. Well, guys, it is wonderful to be with you today. My name is Brad G. Uh, I'm one of the elders here, as most of you know. Um, and I'm really thankful to be exploring the Word of God with you all today. Let's pray as we get started. Heavenly Father, we come before you, the one who gives us light. And we just ask that you would illuminate this word for us today, that you would draw near to us as we attempt to draw near to you, that you would show us your face as you did to Moses. Um, we're thankful that you have placed the temple within us and that we have your Holy Spirit living in us uh, and that you are living and active. So be with us today as we examine your word. Pray this all in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, this is easily like a top, probably a top five chapter in the Bible for me. I love John 15. Uh, Romans 8 would be up there. Um, there's a few others. But John 15 is this really beautiful examination of of Jesus in like the final time that he has with his disciples before he goes off to die for our sins. And you get this incredible distillation of everything that Jesus finds important in this passage. He is working on showing his disciples, like if you were about to leave on a trip, right? And your family's all staying at home and you're going, like, you're not just going to tell them some random thing. Be like, oh, by the way, can you mow the lawn tomorrow? Like, no, you're going to give them a giant hug, and you're going to kiss your kids on the forehead, and you're going to tell them that you love them, right? And if you, for example, if you were like a guy going off to war, and you had children, and you want to give your children advice, and there's this like threat of never coming back, you would want to share with them some of the most important things that you have on your heart about how they ought to live their lives. And that's kind of where we're at with Jesus. The cool thing is, Jesus does come back and he's not leaving forever. He never leaves us alone. He sends us the Holy Spirit, right? But he still is, this is one of the last times he's gonna be physically in person with them here on this earth. 
And so he's sharing these really important things. And this, this imagery of the vine that we get, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. We, we've heard this many, many times over, right? It's, it's a very common phrase in Christianity that we have to stay attached to the vine, that we abide in Jesus, that the source of all life is Jesus and it flows into us and we have to be attached to him, right? We've all heard this before. If you haven't, then let's go get coffee sometime and we'll talk more. But this is such a common uh, metaphor in modern Christianity and the, the interesting thing is, it also was a very common metaphor during the time of Jesus, during, during that, the first century. In Judaism, though, they would use this idea of the vineyard. And if you read the Old Testament, you see it all around. You see it in Psalm, you see it in Isaiah, you see it in so many different passages where the Jews understood the vineyard as a metaphor for the geographic location of Israel. Does that make sense? They, they would use the vineyard as a metaphor, as an example, but they would use it to talk about how we, the Israelites, are planted in the right ground, right? We've been given this promised land and God has given us blessings because we're here in this physical geographic region and we're, we're near the temple. And the temple is a geographic place. It's a, it's a point on the map that you can put into Google Maps and say, okay, where's the temple of God? Okay, that's where the presence of God is, right? So they had this idea of a vineyard that was very common, commonly taught by rabbis at the time. But for them, it was not about being attached to something. It was about we are the vine that has been planted in the holy ground that God has given us. Do you guys kind of feel that difference? How that, how that feels different than what Jesus is saying here? Because what Jesus is saying here is absolutely explosive for the first century listener. This idea that it is not what your bloodline is. It is not where you are planted, where you live. It's not the temple that you go to, right? At the start of John, we watched Jesus go to this Samaritan woman. And what does he say to the Samaritan woman when she says, like, hey, like, where are we going to worship? Are we, are we going to worship on your mountain down in Jerusalem? Are we going to worship on this mountain up in Samaria? Like, what's going on here? You're a prophet. You need to explain this to me. And how does Jesus answer her? He's like, hey, there's a time coming. We don't have to worry about which mountain we're worshiping on because we're going to be worshiping me. And the temple is going to be within you. And it's this beautiful redefinition of everything that all Jews thought at the time about how religion worked, about who they were as a people and why they did the things that they do. So for the Jew, the, their primary thought process in living a holy life it primarily was, do I live in the vineyard, right? Do I live in Israel? And if I live in Israel, I'm good. Jesus is changing it. And his question is this, am I attached to Jesus? Am I attached to the vine? And once again, all throughout the book of John, you know, Jordan commented that we've been doing the book of John since before or right after Alistair was born. Uh, and he is, I don't know, two, two and a half now. So we've been doing the book of John for quite some time. And I hope you have seen over the last few years how Jesus throughout the book of John is constantly looking at the physical world around him and saying, guys, there's a lot more to the world than what you see. There's a lot more to the world than the bread you eat and the, the calendar day on which you eat that bread. Right? Sabbath was not made for, for man. The man was made for Sabbath. That, that there's this there's this incredible redefinition from just focusing on the physical, on our daily activities, on our actions, and saying, no, there's a spiritual reality that undergirds all of the things that we see here on the planet. And the frustrating thing for so many people is that this physical reality being redefined into a spiritual foundation, we can't see it. 
Does that sound silly to say? We can't just look and go, wow, there's some angels flying around, and wow, there's some demons flying around, and man, I, I took this action in the physical world, and, and it, yes, it created something, but there's a spiritual reality also being created, right? Like, we don't see that as we take actions. We don't see the spiritualness. And so it becomes this weird in-between state of like, Yes, I know that I need to stay attached to Jesus, but what does that actually mean? And the, the three things I want to talk about today is that there's three elements of Christian life. There's three elements of Christian life. And, and they're all a pathway, and they're all a journey, and they're all things that we grow in as we move along this journey of life. Uh, the first one is the way of believing. The way of believing. At the end of the day, what we believe matters, right? The things that we intellectually assent to, the things that we say are true about the world are very important because the things that we say are true about the world have meaning and consequences. How we look at other people, when we look at other people, what are the basic beliefs about a human being, where we come from, where we're going? Right? These are all truths that are important for us to process. The second way is the way of living. Right, Another word for this would be ethics. Like, how do I act in the world in a moral way? Right, And this is a big portion of Christian teaching, right? If you look at Proverbs, the book of Proverbs is a whole long book on like, hey, here are healthy ways to live in the world. You probably shouldn't go hang out with prostitutes all the time if you're a guy or a guy. Uh, nobody should probably hang out with prostitutes all the time, right? There, there's all sorts of stuff in Proverbs that talks about these different ways of living that it, it matters who our friends are, right? The people who we hang out with, it, it's going to affect who we are. But finally, there, there's something that I think is true here in this passage. The third way that, that it's important what we believe and it's important how we live. But, but the reality that undergirds those two things in the same way that that spiritual reality undergirds the physical reality around us is the way of experiencing. The way of experiencing. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about here in this passage. Because at the end of the day, if we believe that Jesus is a vine, and that's it. We just go, yeah, Jesus is a vine. Like Jesus talks about this. He, the demons believe in Jesus and who he is, right? And they shudder about it. But that doesn't change the fact that they're demons. They, they intellectually assent to who Jesus is, but that doesn't change the fact of how they experience him. And the same thing with living. I, unfortunately, I think, one of the, I think one of the most difficult realities of Christianity I don't know if this is going to be nice. Let me think of a nice way to say this. <laughs> Chelsea, I know you appreciate that. How many of us have met older people who have said that they follow Jesus and they read their Bibles and they go to church every week and they're not very fun to be around? Has anybody met them? All right? Chelsea, I know you've met them. <laughs> right? <laughs> We'll cut that out of the recording, just, just in case grandpa ever listens. <laughs> right? That, to me, that is one of the greatest conundrum of Christian life. And, I, and honestly, I don't totally have an answer for you. I kind of have an answer for you. But like, how is it that somebody can read the Bible, can go to a small group, can go to Bible study fellowship, can go to church every week, can do all the Christian things, they can walk along all the things that their pastor has told them to do, and they get to the end of their life and they still are the worst. They're not fun to be around. How is that? That's, that's a genuine question that I, I struggle with. Uh, and, and the answer is in this third way of living. And, and the problem with this answer is that you can believe the answer and you can try to walk out the answer and it won't be true for you until you experience the answer. And, and this is a weird thing, is we assume that when we take actions in the world, that means we are experiencing it. 
And I don't know if I have a good way of describing this. I've spent the entire week trying to figure it out and I don't know if I have. So let me know if you're all confused by the end of this. But there's a difference between what we believe, how we act, and what we experience in the world. And the only reason I can say that is because I've experienced that to be true. I grew up in the church. I was saved when I was five. I went to youth camp. I did all the things, right? I went to Malone University and got an undergrad in Bible and theology. And then I went to seminary and I got a master of divinity. And I worked as a chaplain. And I, I've done all of these holy things. Right? I, I, I moved to Philadelphia for a year and, and did ministry there. I, I've done so many things. I've believed and I've acted just like any Christian should. And yet I still ended up in a place in my early 30s where I was kind of like, my life feels meaningless. And it feels purposeless. And it feels like none of my actions really matter. They don't have consequence. And what I believe doesn't really matter. And it wasn't until I experienced Jesus in a powerful way that it changed what I believe and how I lived. And the, man. The experience of God is such a powerful thing. It's such a powerful thing. Uh, my wife right now is leading a healing care group. Um, and they've been going for, I think, like 10 weeks now out of the 12, 11. You guys have one more week? Wow, tomorrow. The end of an era. That's wild. You have fully healed, no more healing to do. You're going to be done with it. Right? So, sorry. <laughs> So this healing care group's been going on for 12 weeks, and one of the most beautiful things about the healing care group is that we very deeply emphasize the healing does not finish on week 12. It goes on for the rest of our lives. But the entire goal of this group is to help us experience God more deeply. Hi, buddy. <laughs> That's my lovely wife. Is to help us experience God more deeply. There's so many Bible verses that we can believe in and we can try to act out. But it, it all became so clear to me when you look at the Garden of Gethsemane and you look at what Jesus was going through at that time. So Jesus is, is a full human and full God. I don't understand that, but it's pretty cool. And so he has all of the intellectual knowledge of who God is better than any other human being. Right? There's mysteries about God that we'll never understand, but, God, but Jesus, as God, was able to understand. That's really cool. So he has all the intellectual knowledge. He also has all of the ethics, right? the, the pathway of living. He lived a perfect life. He took every right action that he could have. Right? My, my wife took the NCLEX to become a nurse like a decade ago now, and she talked about how you know it's all multiple choice answers, and there's one wrong answer, and one most right answer, and then there's two kind of right answers, right? And I think that life can be that way a lot of times, that we have like definite wrong answers and probably a definite most right answer, but a lot of our choices in life are like mostly right. Like they might not be perfect, but they're not bad, and we're, we're trying to do the best as we can because we're all human. Jesus didn't struggle with that. Jesus got to walk through and make the most right answer every single time. So he knows everything, and he makes the most right choices every time. And yet in Gethsemane, what happens? He comes to a point where he says, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I have zero desire to make the most right decision that you have placed in front of me. So much so that I am bleeding instead of sweating. Like, that's a wild reality. And yet, where do we see Jesus one day from there? We see him beaten, bloody to a pulp, on a cross, dying for our sins, submitting himself to the will of God. What happened? What happened? I believe deep, deep, 
deep down in my heart that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus experienced the power of God's love for him in such a way that there was nothing he could do but go and die on the cross for our sins. That he received the outpouring of God's love and care and reassurance, so much so that he could continue to walk in the pathway that God had set out before him. I think about Paul, that Paul knew all the right answers. He knew Judaism better than almost any other rabbi out there. He was following the right way, right? He writes about this. He's like, I was a Jew of all Jews. I knew all the right answers. I was planted in the proper vineyard. I was doing all the right things. And yet until he had an experience of the risen Christ, he was murdering and thought that he was righteous. And once he had that experience of Christ, once he had that vision of a risen Lord and Savior, asking him, why are you, why are you hurting me? Why are you doing these things to me? Until he had that experience, he was one way, but once he had that experience, everything changed. Here's another weird thing that Paul talks about that we don't often talk about in the church. Uh, in Stephen, is it in Corinthians that he talks about the visions of the higher realms? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so Stephen doesn't even know. He, got, he has an MDiv too. I'm throwing him under the bus. So we talk about this so little in the church, but Paul literally, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians, talks about visions of a higher reality and of like other planets of reality. Have you guys ever heard of this? Raise your hand if you've heard of this. True, like truly, raise your hand if you've heard of it. Look around, I am the only one with my hand raised, right? This is a weird thing, please look it up, I am not crazy. Paul has these visions of another reality that he literally says are too great for me to explain. I can't figure them out. Are you telling me that our physical reality is the only thing that determines where we're at in life? Or is the continued abiding in Jesus, is staying connected to the vine far more than the physical act of looking at words in a, in a book at least once a day for 10 minutes, right? Now, I'm not disparaging the word of God. I, I have deep, deep respect for what God has given us here. And I'm so thankful that he's revealed himself to us in his word. But clearly, the physical act of looking at this and thinking, hmm, how can I love people more today? has not led to people always being more loving. It is that experience of Jesus that changes everything. Until we experience this awe-inspiring love of Jesus, it's really hard to believe and live out that love. But here's the thing. All of us have met somebody who we know has experienced Jesus, right? Have you ever met that person that you just spend five minutes with them and you're like, I don't know what it is, but that person knows Jesus. They might not be able to, to quote scripture. They might not be able to read, write, or do arithmetic, but they know Jesus. Everybody knows a person like that, right? If you don't, I, I want you to know a person like that. And my curiosity is, as we look at this abiding, as we look at staying connected to Jesus, is... Where are our spiritual experiences? When is the last time that you experienced Jesus in such a way that he felt real to you? When was the last time that you experienced Jesus in such a way that you walked away from that, that chronology, that moment in time, and you go, man, I can't help but be more loving to the person that I hated 10 minutes ago. I can't help but be a little, have a little more self-control. I can't help but be a little more patient with my children. I can't help but display the fruits of the Spirit after this experience that I had with Jesus. When was that last time? And I, I kind of want to move into our response time. 
Uh, we, we believe deeply here at Delco that the Word of God is a beautiful thing and that we need to actively respond to it. And once again, this is that weird tension between the way we live and the way we experience, right? Because we could do this week after week after week, and it could become just a way of living, right? And, and, and hear me, I'm going to qualify something I said earlier. I, like, the way we live is important, right? It is, it is uh, what we experience is like the helium filling up the balloon. Right? And the, the balloon itself is the way that we live and we move about in the world. It's the thing that we see. But what we experience is kind of hard to see. It's kind of hard to quantify, to say, I know exactly what happened, and scientifically, here's what went on. But as we, as we enter into response time, I want us to remember that the important thing here is not that we engage in a rote activity. The reason we do this every week is because I don't know about you, but I'm very busy and I have a job and kids and friends and family and things competing for my time. And I don't often have an uninterrupted 10, 20, 30 minute period to just say, Jesus, are you there? Are you with me? And so we'd like to give you, man, I love having new people here because I can say whatever I want. But I'd be like, man, we're gonna have like 45 minutes of things and she wouldn't even know any difference. We do about 10 minutes of response time. It's not too long. Not too long, but I wanna take about 10 minutes and I want to think on two levels. I want us to think on the negative and I want us to think on the positive. So first the negative. What keeps us from experiencing God? Um, I, I was talking to my really good friend, Dr. Joshua Henry, who doesn't always like being referred to as doctor, but he has uh, two PhDs and he's like 30 now. And he has a PhD in horticulture and a PhD in crop sciences. So he knows a lot about plants. And as I was writing this sermon, I was like, man, I'm writing about vines. I should give my friend Josh a call. And I asked Josh, I said, Josh, what would cause a branch to die on a vine? Like, like, like an actual vine plant, what would cause a branch to die, even if it's attached to a healthy vine, right? Why would an individual branch die? Because if you guys know the answer, that's great, but I know almost nothing about plants. And I was like, I, why wouldn't they all die? Why would they, like if the vine is still alive, why are certain branches dying? And he said this, and you guys can make your own meaning from this because I think it's pretty obvious, uh, that either A, one of the branches grew into a dark place where the, the uh, flowers or the grapes or the leaves can't see the sun and it withers away and dies because it needs the sun, even the individual branches. So does that hit? You guys, you guys got that? You need the sun, uh huh? Secondly, uh, that the vine itself, I think this is the kind of the cooler one. The vine itself, right? You have the branches coming off of it and then the vine, Jesus is our vine. That the vine, right now I'm not talking about Jesus. The vine will cut off certain branches if they, if they gain some sort of parasite or disease. Isn't that cool? Like the vine will know, oh, this branch has something going on and I don't want it to infect the entire thing. So it will stop sending nutrients to that branch until it dies and falls off. Isn't that wild? That's absolutely wild. Here's, here's the interesting thing for me. When we look at our life and we think about what keeps us from experiencing God, I'm going to focus more on the first one because I don't think that Jesus cuts us off. Um, I think that he lovingly cares for us in our times of struggle. Um, I think that there might be times where Jesus cuts us off from the rest of the church in a sense because he doesn't want to have the rest of his body get hurt. And we need some time alone or with a small group of people to care for us when we're struggling. But I don't think that means we're like, detached from the vine. I think Jesus loves being attached to us. So just so I'm clear on that. But where are the places that we've grown into the dark? I think that's an easy question and it's an easy image to think about as we, as we ponder where have we grown in our life? Where has our life naturally grown towards where it's not in the light of Christ's love anymore? 
And here's the thing, it's, it's hard to look at the negatives in life and not feel judgment, right? It's hard to look at and say, man, I know that Jesus has been calling me into this area of his light and I just haven't lived into it. I haven't walked in the way that he has asked me to walk. And that can feel hard and shameful and undignifying, but I, I'm here to remind you that your identity is secure in God. Who you are is not going to change whether or not you live into the places that he has called you to be. And that's a really hard thing to hold on to as a Christian because we have lived in a society of legalism for so long that says you are only as good as your activity, your performance for God. And so I'm here to just remind you, as you look at the things that keep you from God, be curious about it. Do not be judgmental. Have an attitude of curiosity. Because more often than not, there's an answer. Why have I not lived into the area that God has asked me to live into? Well, when we look at that with judgment and shame, it keeps us from actually ever examining what's going on and what's keeping us from God. But when we engage with that place in curiosity and we say, Jesus, hey, will you forgive me for this? I know you've asked me to move into it. And I just need your forgiveness because I haven't done it. And then Jesus will say, yes, you are forgiven. I love you. You're great. You're my child. I think you're beautiful and amazing and wonderful. Let's look at why you haven't been doing it. And all of a sudden, when that judgment and shame is gone and you can be curious about it, there's usually some interesting answers as to why we act the way we act. So, side one, negative. And when I say negative, I mean the things that are keeping us from God, right? Side two, positive. How do I experience God the best? And I want you guys to write down, think about moments in your life where you're like, man, at this moment in my life, I experienced Jesus so powerfully. And I want you to write down or think about, you know, what was the weather like that day? What was my relationship with my family like that day? How was work going at the time? You know, maybe it was when you were a child. How was school going at the time? But remember a time where you truly felt deeply close to God. And as you recognize some of those things that, that filtered into you being close to God, those are important. Be curious about those. And say, Jesus, like, are those things that you want to replicate in my life today? Are those things that you want to use to draw me in with you again? So I'm going to give you guys about 10 minutes. You can pray. You can journal. You can go for a walk around the parking lot. I... I don't care what you guys do. However you want to connect with Jesus, you connect with Jesus. Uh, I'm going to pray us into this time. Um, and at the end of the 10 minutes, I'm going to take us through a, a Lectio Divina real quick, do a open hands, close hands prayer. Um, and we'll close our time together. Does that sound good? All right, Jesus, we come before you. Thankful. Thankful for your word. Jesus, you, you just have given us so many avenues to abide in you. And we're thankful this morning that we got to examine what it looks like to abide in you through your word. Open our hearts as we examine our lives. Open our hearts as we look at the negative things that keep us from you. Open our hearts as we look at the positive things that draw us near to you. And give us your wisdom. Guide us, Jesus. We believe that you are literally here walking alongside us. That when you said that you sent your spirit to guide us, that that is a literal thing that is here with us, whispering in our ears the way that we ought to go. So be with us, Jesus. Amen.